I'm sorry, we're, we're about to enter the realm of the inconceivable. And so that's just where we're headed. Uh, that is the name of this chapter, which is the inconceivable liberation. We're going to be talking all night about the inconceivable liberation. Um, I mentioned last week that we're kind of on easy street now because we're only doing one chapter tonight, uh, just chapter six. Um, as you can see, we've got a lot of information to go over tonight. Um, in many ways, this is the night you've all been waiting for, right? Like Michael said at the end of his meditation on Thursday, everything up to this point has sort of been an opener an opening salvo to get us to this chapter. Um, and so it's kind of nice to just spend one night on it. Again, it's sort of the, the, the not quite the climax of the sutra, but it's definitely sort of the key chapter to understanding. It. And I actually have a few things to say uh, about <clears throat> this chapter in general, but really tonight is the night you've all been waiting for because tonight, we're talking about the supernormal powers. That's right. We're talking about telekinesis. We're talking about telepathy. We're talking about flotation. We're talking about all of that. And so tonight, I'm actually going to probably start by going over the super knowledges. This is a phrase that's come up a few times in our sutra now that this guy, Vimalakirti, likes to play with the super knowledges. Right, they've dropped that on us a few times, and I have resisted telling you what the super knowledges were, and because tonight's the night. Um, so, and the reason why I'm actually going to start with that is that you know, there's so much going on with this sutra, there's so much going on with this chapter, and it's one of those things where it gets a lot funnier, it, it is a lot more fun if you know some backdrop, like some ideas that they're playing with, playing off of. So I'm going to give you all of that <clears throat> uh, ahead of time so that then we can um, read the chapter. Um, I'm going to do the chapter tonight, I think, in four movements. There's more or less kind of four distinct parts of this chapter. Um, Really quickly, though, before we dive into all this, before we dive into the super knowledges, because I'm going to be referencing it, I think, a few times. Uh, again, I'm usually reading from the Robert Thurman translation, and I needed to make a correction. Uh, this whole time, these classes, I've been saying that um, kind of reading from the Sanskrit version or whatever, he's translating from Tibetan, all right? And it's easy to sort of make that to stay because Tibetan and Sanskrit have a lot of similarities, but it's mainly that because all of his, uh, his glossary, all his footnotes, kind of the whole thing is in Sanskrit. So I keep referring to it as the Sanskrit version, but I kind of want to make clear that there's not really a Sanskrit version of the Vimalakirti Sutra. I'm not going to get too into the weeds of scholarship here, but there's sort of this assumed original Vimalakirti Sutra that was in Sanskrit. And most scholars, including myself, agree, yeah, there, there must have been one. It's obvious that there was one. And then eventually that one gets translated into Chinese, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a moment, gets translated into Tibetan, gets translated into Thai, gets translated into Japanese, and so on and so on. And then eventually, I think a Thai version gets translated back into Sanskrit. So there is a Sanskrit version, but it's coming, you know, from the Thai version. So it's sort of a little weird there. Very quickly, though, because I never gave a full, uh, like, colophon or a, a full description of where this text is coming from. <laughs> Obviously, as you know now, it's kind of a unique sutra that way. Yeah, it's claiming to be a story from the time of the Buddha, but obviously things are pretty wild. And so it's easily understood as a story or as an allegory. But what I want you to know for anybody that's historically curious here is that for preparation for tonight, I've been reading over these three uh, Chinese versions. And what's really interesting is that the Tibetan version that Robert Thurman's translating from is 
probably at the earliest around from about 900 AD, CE, whichever system you use. What you should know is, and again, I'm probably going to reference this a few times tonight, so I want to note this ch ch uh, Chinese version of it by a, a monk, a Chinese monk, not quite Chinese, actually a slightly more Tibetan, but not Tibetan, that region though. Um, he was a monk named Zhi Qian, and Zhi Qian, he rolled up into China, he knew a bunch of different languages, and he started translating sutras for the emperor, for the empire, for China. And in 220, 220 AD, 220 CE, again, whichever system you use, Zhi Qian was like, you guys haven't heard the Vimalakirti Sutra? Oh, well, we got to get on this. And so he created the first Chinese translation presumably from an original Sanskrit version. And that was in 220 AD. And at that point, he was like, oh, you guys haven't heard this? This is a classic. So, you know, even if you want to, you know, uh, not accept that this is, has anything to do with the Buddha from 500 BC, it's still a very, very old text, right? And so I'm going to be referencing a lot of differences between this early, early, early version and then the more popular Chinese version from Kumarajiva that was from about 406. And then an even later Chinese version by again, a guy named Xuanzang. And he issued his in 650. So you get these almost 200 years apart that these Chinese translations happen. And there's a lot of interesting differences between them that actually help reveal the meaning of the sutra in any language. So I just wanted you to know, I'm going to be reading from the Thurman uh, translation from the Tibetan, but also noting some Chinese translations. So that's a little uh, technical stuff I had to do. So uh, let's, we're going to get into it. So tonight we are talking about these Abhinya, as they're called, A B H I J N Y A A. Now, most of my students have been coming to me for a while, even though I may have never even used this word Abhinya, Abhinya before, you probably already know what it means, right? So Abhi, A B H I, this is a prefix that is, uh, you probably are familiar uh, with it from the Abhi Dharma. So that's a collection of some more technical Buddhist teachings on the Dharma. There's a lot of um, reason or logic to translating Abhi as meta, M-E-T-A, like above. Very, very similar to uh, Aristotle's physics, he had the physics, and then he wrote the further physics called the metaphysics. So in Greek, you've got the physics, the basics, and then you've got the metaphysics, right? The, the higher physics or, you know. Same thing with Abhi, you've got the Dharma, the physics of it all, and you've got the Abhi Dharma, this sort of meta Dharma. It's like a little bit above the regular Dharma. So Abhi is kind of like this above or meta. And then Nya, classic J-N-Y-A, knowledge. We see this Nya, this root word Nya, we see it in Nyana, Vijnana, Samya, Pranya. I could be here all night. All of these Buddhist words that are the root is about knowledge, knowing, and then these twists on knowing right? Well, tonight is Abhinya, super knowledge, right? Now, this is a whole world of, of Buddhism that's very interesting. There's a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of discourses that refer to these super knowledges or superpowers. Uh, one of the primary old, old Buddhist texts, the um, the Samanapala, the fruits of the homeless life. I teach that a lot. It goes through these supernormal powers. There's a lot, this is an old tradition. And, and again, it's why I'm going through this ahead of time before we talk about the sutra. 
because this is a very old tradition in India that doing these practices, doing meditation, doing certain types of yoga produce supernormal powers. Um, these are sometimes referred to as riddhis, uh, R-D-D-H-I, and sometimes they're referred to as siddhis. These are all words I'm going to go over tonight. But again, I just want you to know this goes way back. And uh, here I have a list of eight specific superpowers that are specific to the Buddhist tradition. The ability to be in multiple places at once, have multiple bodies called transformation bodies. The ability to be invisible. The ability to pass through solid objects. The ability to sink into the ground like it's water. The ability to walk on water like it's the ground. The ability to fly. The ability to touch the sun and the moon. And the ability to go up to the Brahma heavens. Now that's the tr traditional Buddhist list of eight riddhis. This word riddhi is interesting. It means uh, like a, mm, it kind of means a wealth or prosperity, but not necessarily in kind of a money way. Um, there seems to possibly be some um, roots, the riddhi in like a root, like taking root and this idea of like that your, that your labor has come to fruit have come to fruition. So that's the idea of a riddhi. And actually the word siddhi that you might be familiar with, which is usually translated as supernormal power, siddhi also means like accomplishment. And one of the things I'm going to emphasize from not just a Buddhist point of view, but from the meditation world, all of these things I'm describing are traditionally understood as symptomatic of enlightenment. These are symptoms of development. Traditionally, even in the, the kind of the, the old school Samkhya, Pantanjali, Yoga Sutra tradition in which these are talked about as well, they're not goals. It's not the point of doing the meditation. It's just something that kind of starts to happen and it's indicators to you, the meditator, that it's working, <laughs> but the idea is they're not goals. So there's these eight, but as I just mentioned, this tradition goes way back. And I wanted you to know that in the Patanjali, the yoga sutras, the eight superpowers are having a peaceful aura, power of persuasion, also a sense of wealth, but in, in the sense of having everything that you need, uh, virility, piercing insight, uh, sensory control, happiness, and tapas or heat. These are the kind of the eight powers of the Patanjali system. But then in an older Samkhya, uh, which is kind of a related uh, philosophical system, sort of contemporaneous with Buddhism, they listed the eight. And I wanted you to note that the Patanjali had eight. Uh, the Samkhya system has their eight, but these eight are very interesting, and they're gonna, you're going to hear these tonight as well, which is, again, why I'm telling you this. This is an established tradition that another list of eight is the ability to shrink one's body down to the size of an atom, the ability to enlarge one's body to the size of a mountain, the ability to become weightless, the, the ability to become immovably heavy, the ability to be anywhere, which is sort of like a teleportation kind of idea, the ability to fill, fulfill all desires, fulfill all of one's own desires, and that's another sort of traditionally an indication of having everything that you would ever need or want. Number seven is the ability to rule over nature. And number eight in this older system is to control nature. So at a certain point, you're just like king of the jungle where everybody bows down to you. But then you reach a point where you can actually like stop it from raining, make it rain, things like that. So those are another list of eight. And one of the things that I just wanted, the reason why I'm going through all of this is that there is this tradition in India and these meditation traditions to 
basically these come in eights, <laughs> right? It's just like, you can have this list of eight, that list of eight, the Buddha's list of eight. I'm going to get to a different eight later this evening, which is why I'm doing all of this. But there seems to be something going on with the number eight and these powers. Now, those are specifically the superpowers, the riddhis. But in Buddhism, you will often hear about the pansa, Abhijnana, the five Abhijnana, the five super knowledges, and sometimes the six super knowledges. I have the six up here. These are all six in Buddhism. So the first one is the divine eye, right? And here we have, I believe, I, uh, this is supposed to be Aniruddha. Aniruddha, I didn't get to read his section last time. He's one of the disciples, one of the Shravakas. Anyways, he has the divine eye. The ability to see through solid objects, three, uh, see uh, other dimensions, see vast distances, like binocular vision, right? And of course, what was funny, and I didn't get to read it, is that our hero Vimalakirti, he kind of schools Aniruddha and asking him, well, basically regarding his ego and exactly which eye is it that can see and how far. It's kind of the emptiness talk that he gives to Aniruddha. Number two of these traditional siddhis or, or accomplishments is the divine ear. Here we have our little monk. This is the ability to hear heavenly voices, hear vast distances. Um, uh, this is the, the divine ear is often associated with the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, hearer of the world's sighs or hearer of the world's crying. This is a, uh, the development of that div of the divine ear gave that bodhisattva the ability to hear everyone's wailing and suffering. Uh, but traditionally, this is the ability to hear heavenly beings uh, or to hear someone calling from very far away. Number three in the Buddhist tradition is the ability to read others' minds. This was also came up with uh, Upali. Upali is like the main monk in charge of uh, the rules of the Vinaya. And it's actually a really interesting story. Also, I didn't get to read it last time, where Vimalakirti is schooling Upali because these two monks broke the same rule, but they did it for different reasons. And so Upali was faced with the problem of, should I give these guys the same punishment or, or suggest the same discipline because they committed the same uh, transgression. And then Malakirti says, no, you should use your divine power of, of reading their minds to know what their intention was and uh, give the discipline based on that. So just to let you know, that kind of popped up in last chapter and I didn't get to read it. Number five in this list is Oh, sorry. Number four is knowing past and future lives of both oneself and others. Okay. And here I tried to draw one of the monks kind of having that past life regression kind of experience of seeing all his past lives. Again, for Buddhism, this is also future lives. So there's a sense in this magical power of knowing the past and future lives. There's also just a general sense of being able to see the future and kind of understand the very distant past. Um, number five the, is just the powers that I went over. And again, the list varies from different sutra to sutra, depending, but they are always eight. And then finally, this kind of brings me to the point of tonight, and then we'll jump into the sutra. Normally, like pre-Buddhism and early Buddhism, there's five siddhis. There's these five superpowers, of which one of them is like multiple physical superpowers. But the idea is um, that there was traditionally five. The Buddha came along and he added this sixth one. And this sixth one, I think, is a really good insight into the ethos, if you will, of the sutra tonight. The sixth supernormal power, sixth siddhi in Buddhism is or the super knowledge, the abhinya, is the knowledge of the cessation of suffering. <laughs> the, the, that know, knowing peace, knowing tranquility, that's the superpower. 
And so why I say that or I, why I emphasize that is that all of this tonight, something to have in the back of your mind is like the idea of like, why, why would you want to walk on water? Why would you want to be able to do these things? <laughs> Right. And so go back to that idea of these things being rather symptomatic of enlightenment, but not necessarily goals. And so a lot of what this is addressing tonight, and actually I'll just use this as a good segue to our star of our show, Vimala Kirti. Right. I think I said this the first night. If I didn't, my bad. Vimala Kirti. Right. So Vimala is this word that means stainless or flawless, perfect, undefiled. And Vimala is sort of, I, I know I mentioned this, but it's this idea of sort of like, we're in this non-duality realm here. And so this idea of like judging things as pure and judging things as impure, well, Vimala is when you don't do that. That's purity, not judging things as pure and impure. So Vimala is this like, it's purity and undefilement, but it's undefiled by duality, undefiled by the ego, undefiled by da-da-da-da-da. Kirti is fame, notoriety. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this now tonight is the thing that happens in India. The thing that happens is that if you display these superpowers, you could become famous. You could become known. And for those who were not so interested in the Dharma or no, not so interested in liberation, you could wow the crowds and get a lot of dana in your little begging bowl if you levitated, if you performed one of these feats, you could become known become famous and uh, and the seat and obtaining the siddhis obtaining these accomplishments makes one a siddha so if you get the siddhis you are a siddha and then that turns into the idea of a maha siddha a great siddha maha siddhas are magicians street performers that would do these things and they were of great renown they were well known as miracle workers vimalakirti is a miracle worker i don't know if you've noticed but this guy's been pulling rabbits out of his hat all night long right so the idea here is is that this whole sutra is a discourse on ma the magic on magical powers on metaphysics and all of that but it's going to be a very Buddhist twist on all of these ideas I've just gone over with. All right. So it, all the way down to this guy's name, Vimalakirti, right? Okay. So that's a very long intro, but well worth it because now we're going to fly by. Any questions on that preliminary stuff before I get into? Cool. All right, so here you go. This is the famous chapter six, the inconceivable liberation, which I'm going to talk at length about this when the sutra arrives at it. So hold on. Because first, so after all of that, right, after the Buddha made all the parasols into one giant parasol and put us under it safely, and after Vimalakirti gave his Dharma talk to the people, and after the disciples refused to go see him, and after the Bodhisattvas refused to go see him, finally Manjushri steps up. Manjushri, crown prince of the Dharma, with his obsidian sword, goes up and discourses with the Malakirti. That was the heart of last class, heart of Michael's meditation on Thursday, right? Was that meaty discourse between Manjushri and the Malakirti. But then, the Venerable Shariputra had this thought. And if you'll recall, right before everybody showed up, Vimalakirti did this really funny thing in which he made all the furniture in his house disappear. Made all his servants disappear, made the lamps disappear. He made everything empty. He made his house empty. Yes, that's funny. Like I said last time, this sutra is supposed to be funny. You're supposed to be rolling in the aisles, right? 
But now we're going to go a little further with that really funny idea of Amalekirti making his house empty and maybe get a little insight into what's the real meaning of that. So Vener the Venerable Shariputra, he looks around <clears throat> and has this thought. There isn't a single chair in this house. Where are these disciples and great bodhisattvas going to sit? <laughs> Okay, so even before, even before I tell you the punchline, right? I got to tell you what's going on with this question because, again, this is like a very famous moment, a very famous line of the sutra where Shariputra asked, where are we supposed to sit? And I want you, and this is all very well worthwhile. All of this meditation stuff, in particular the dhyana stuff, the mindful, focused awareness stuff that we've been talking about. The point of all of those practices is that there's an object. There's something that you're resting your mind on. And within the very poetic language of Buddhism, resting on or in certain meditative states say like resting on a little fire circle, a little fire flame, and that being your abode. This is the poetic language that they would use, the abode of your meditation. And if you are in a certain abode long enough, you can transcend that abode and sort of be reborn in these dionic heavens. And then if you're familiar with the formless realms, the realm of, of infinite space, infinite consciousness, neither perception nor non-perception, those are also abodes. And the idea is, is that when you are in the samadhi or the formless dhyana on infinite space, you are in the realm or the abode of infinite space. In other words, that's where you're sitting. It's what you're sitting on. It's what you're sitting in. It's what you're meditating on. And so if you've been following the sutra, or if you've just been following these lessons in Mahayana Buddhism up to this point, and you're, and you're with it, and you're like, oh, wow, Lakshana, got it. Oh, wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit the number of objects till I get down to just single object. And then I'm going to even let go of single object by divesting it of its various qualities until I get down to infinite space and da 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 The idea is, is that you're always moving towards resting on something, right? Shari Pucha's like, where am I supposed to meditate? What am I supposed to meditate on? I don't get it. So if you took, uh, if you were with Michael Taft on Thursday, he did this in his meditation very beautifully in that way where he's, uh, he did it actually even the, the, the first Thursday night of his too, where it's this suggestion to have no fixed reference point. To, to not be focusing on this or your breath or a candle flame or this, but actually to have no reference point. To, and in, in, the, in the idea of kashanti, endurance or patience, to be cool with that, to not allow the mind to focus, right? And so I want everybody to appreciate Shariputra, like the subtle, subtle significance of Shariputra's question. He is an old school Theravadan monk who's used to. Uh, placing his mind on different places. And he's just been explained by Vimalakirti to, to have the mind nowhere, be nowhere attached to nothing. And so that idea gets encapsulated in this funny story of him making his house empty. And then Shariputra wondering, where am I going to sit down? So it's, it's, that's how this sutra is operating. They're taking very, very profound philosophical questions and then putting it in the form of jokes, <laughs> stories, and one-liners, right? Okay. So Shariputra wonders, where are all these disciples and all these bodhisattvas going to sit? The Lichavi Vimalakirti read the thoughts of the Venerable Shariputra and said, Shariputra, did you come here for the sake of the Dharma or did you come here for the sake of a chair? Right? 
classic answer, uh, you know, famous. The Malakirti continues, Venerable Shariputra, someone who is interested in the Dharma is not interested even in their own body, much less a chair. Shariputra, someone who is interested in the Dharma has no interest in form, sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness. They have no interest in these five aggregates of being or in the four great elements or in the six objects of sensation. Interested in the Dharma, someone has no interest in the realm of desire, the realm of form, or even the formless realm. Interested in the Dharma, they are not interested in attachment to the Buddha, attachment to the Dharma, or even attachment to the Sangha. Venerable Shariputra, someone who is interested in the Dharma is not interested in recognizing suffering, abandoning its origin, realizing its cessation, or even practicing the path. How's that? The Dharma is ultimately without formulation and without verbalization. Who verbalizes? Suffering should be recognized. Origination should be eliminated. Cessation should be realized. The path should be practiced. That person is not interested in the Dharma. They're interested in verbalizing. Shariputra, the Dharma is calm and peaceful. Those who are engaged in production and destruction are not interested in the Dharma. They're not interested in solitude. They're interested in production and destruction. <laughs> Furthermore, Shariputra, the Dharma is without taint and free of defilement. Vimala. Someone who is attached to, to anything, even to liberation, is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in the taint of desire. The Dharma is not an object. Someone who pursues objects is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in objects. The Dharma is without acceptance and without rejection. Someone who holds on to things or lets go of things is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in holding on to things and letting go of things. The Dharma is not a safe refuge. Someone who enjoys a secure, safe refuge is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in secure, safe refuges. The Dharma is without characteristic sign or mark. Someone whose consciousness pursues signs, qualities, and marks is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in signs, characteristics, and marks. The Dharma is not a society. Someone who seeks to associate with the Dharma is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in association. The Dharma is not a sight, a sound, a category, or even an idea. Someone who is involved in sights, sounds, categories, and ideas is not interested in the Dharma, but is interested in sights, sounds, categories, and ideas. Shariputra, the Dharma is free of compounded things and free of uncompounded things. Someone who adheres to compounded things and uncompounded things, they're not interested in the Dharma, but they're interested in adhering to compounded things and uncompounded things. Therefore, Shariputra, if you're interested in the Dharma, you should take no interest in anything at all. When Vimalakirti had spoken this discourse, 500 gods obtained the purity of their Dharma eye in viewing the equality of all things. All right, that's the end of the opener, end of the first movement. Questions, ideas, or comments about the first movement? Should be pretty straightforward as far as like the theme of the sutra, right? From 
the very first Vimalakirti teaching, it was about non-attachment to the body that's sick and dying, non-attachment to the world of form, sight, sounds, taste, and touch, not attachment to anything. Like that was the practice, this sort of non-clinging, non-possessive, even in a way non-identification of objects to be grasped at or desired, right? So the theme of this should be clear. Um, this type of, um, uh, this type of response, of course, is really indicative of Vimalakirti, you know, real firecracker, this guy, right? Like once, he, once he gets going, he really lays into you. So I wanted to read it in full just to give you that full flavor there. But again, the message to little Shariputra here, uh, that's the Chinese character for to sit. It's usually actually the Chinese character for to do meditation. So in Chinese, it's even easier to see the relationship of what's being asked about where am I supposed to meditate is what he's asking, right? Um, but Shariputra being the whipping boy here for Vermalakirti, also classic. Yeah. Okay. Everybody ready to get to the inconceivable? Let's get to the inconceivable. So here's the deal. Oh, no, no, no. Before we go to the inconceivable. By the way, on the just on where we're at right now, the oldest version, that 220, that 220 AD Chinese version, doesn't have that little uh, Shariputra wears the chairs thing. And quite possibly then could have been a slightly later edition. All the other versions have it, but that earliest one doesn't have it. Just interesting. Uh, the earliest Chinese version starts right here. Where the Lichavi, the Malakirti says to the crown prince Manjushri, 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 you have already been to innumerable hundreds of thousands of Buddha lands, Buddha fields, throughout the multi world system in all ten directions. In which Buddha land? Did you see the best lion thrones with the most finest qualities? Manjushri replied, Noble sir, if one crosses Buddha lands to the east, which are more numerous than all the grains of sand in 32 Ganges rivers, one will discover a world system called Marudavajya. Maru Banner. There dwells a Buddha, a Tathagata called Maru Pradipa Raja, Maru Lamp King. His body measures 8,400,000 yojanas in height, and the height of his throne is 6,800,000 ,000 leagues. The bodhisattvas in that land are 4,200,000 ,000 leagues tall, and their own thrones are 3,400,000 ,000 yojanas high. Noble sir, the finest and most superb thrones exist in that universe, Meru Devajya, which is in the Buddha field of the Tathagata Meru Pradiraja. At that moment, the Licha Vivimalakirti having focused himself in concentration, performed a miraculous feat, such that the Buddha, the Tathagata, Maru Pradipa Raja, in the universe, Maru Devaja, sent to this world system 3,200,000 thrones. These thrones were so tall, spacious and beautiful, that the Bodhisattvas, great disciples, Chakras, Brahmas, Lokapalas, and other gods had never before seen anything like it. The thrones descended from the sky and came to rest in the house of the Licha Vivimalagirti. The 3,200,000 thrones arranged themselves without crowding the house, and the house seemed to enlarge itself accordingly. The great city of Vaishali did not become obscured 
Neither did the land of Jambudvipa, nor the world of four continents. Everything else appeared just as it was before. Then the Licha Vivimalakirti said to the young prince Manjushri, Manjushri, let the bodhisattvas be seated on these thrones, having transformed their bodies to a suitable size. Then those bodhisattvas who had attained the super knowledges transformed their bodies to a height of 4,200,000 yojanas and sat upon the thrones. But the beginner bodhisattvas were not able to transform themselves to sit upon the thrones. Then the Licha Vivimalakirti taught these beginner bodhisattvas a teaching that enabled them to attain the five super knowledges. And having attained them, they transformed their bodies to a height of 4,200,000 yojanas and sat upon the thrones. But still, the great disciples were not able to seat themselves upon the thrones. The Lichavi Vimalakirti said to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, take your seat upon your throne. Shariputra replied, Good sir, those thrones are too big and way too high, and I cannot sit upon them. Vimalakirti said, Shariputra, bow down to the Tathagata, the Buddha, Maru, Pradipa, Raja, and you will be able to take your seat. Then all the great disciples bowed down to the Tathagata, the Buddha, Maru, Pradipa, Raja, and they were seated upon their thrones. Okay, that's the end of the second movement. Wild stuff going on. Thoughts, comments, questions? And this is a question. Is there anything related to the exact numbers they're using? Like why 84,000 keeps on coming up and things like that? Like, Well, yeah, I mean, of course, 84,000 pops up a lot. Um, that's sort of a magic number in Buddhism for a lot. <laughs> So it's a lot, <laughs> real big in that way. I'm not a big numerology guy, and I'm sure there's a ton of numerology going on with these numbers. I think the, an interesting thing about them is this measurement of a yojana, or what Robert Thurman translates as a league, like uh, 80,000 leagues under the sea or whatever. A yojana is actually how far a, an army troop can walk in a day. So it's probably a few miles, I would guess, you know. So 84,000 of those babies is a lot. So that kind of brings me to my first interpretive point about this, which is that this Buddha land, it's a world system. It's not our Buddha land. It's a different Buddha land. But if you were here for the first class, you'll know that this term Buddha Kshetra, Buddha field or Buddha land, we already know that they're states of mind. Right, and so this idea that to the east, eighty-four thousand yojanas or whatever, there's a Buddha land that that man, you know, Manjushri's been to all these Buddha lands, right? So he, and he's seen all of them, right? So this idea that in that Buddha land, the Buddha is as tall as Mount Meru, and if you remember, or if you know from my cosmology class, Meru is that giant cosmic mountain in the middle of a world system, of which. Mount Everest is like tiny compared to Mount Meru, right? Well, this is Meru Devajya. That's the name of that Buddha land or Buddha world. And I was going to talk a lot more about this, but it's just this really interesting thing about banners in Buddhism. So if you think about large, tall banners, it's hard for us moderns, uh, techno moderns, to really, I think, well, it's just something that is lost on us because of the world we live in. Buddhism talks a lot about banners. And the only remnant of what they're talking about that we still have is, is basically semaphore. So, in, you know, we use flags to communicate at long distances. Well, communicating at long distances is called telecommunication. 
telecommunication isn't a telephone necessarily. That was a, a, a more modern invention, but tele, telecommunication, communication at a distance has been a thing, you know, for evs. It's been going on. And one of the oldest ways to telecommunicate is via flags and banners, right? So you have a, a big giant banner that's red, big giant banner that's square, big banner that's triangular, and people can see that at a big distance. And then you could get a, a kind of a daisy chain of flags going on and you can have a relay chain of telecommunication. The only reason with banners and even to a certain degree the idea of a lamp this is telecommunication and indeed he's sending thrones across the multiverse so we're talking serious telecommunication and i just want you to know that the banner maru banner that it's like a sign and and actually if you're familiar um with the term lakshana the old original Chinese translation, he didn't translate it as Maru Banner. He just translated it as Maru Lakshana. The, so it's this idea of like the qualities or the marks or the characteristics of this giant Mount Maru being communicated at a vast distance. That's being communicated in the Sanskrit names of these people or these Bo Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So I just wanted you to know that. What's really going on here though, what I really came to tell you about though, is there is a beautiful discourse going on here about sovereignty, folks. Throne, the king, the sovereign, the ruler, right? And you know, who's the sovereign? Who's the ruler, right? The king. Meru Pradipa Raja, right? So he's the king. So when a lot of people hear this chapter and they hear about the thrones coming and their jeweled thrones, you know, some, some Shariputras and, you know, Shravakas sometimes get freaked out because they're like, what's all the jewels? What's all this throne stuff? Like, we're supposed to be sitting on the ground, right? That's like Shariputra's shtick, right? We're supposed to be sitting on the ground. I can't sit in a chair. Well, What's going on here is a really, really deep message about self-sovereignty. That when one is in these meditative states, like there's a degree of sovereignty going on. And, and I was going to actually talk a lot more about this, but time, as always, has kind of gotten the best of me here. But I just want you to know that what's being discussed is this idea of, well, I mean, you can look at it as um, in this way, this beautiful thing usually it's the iron throne usually there's one of them and usually everybody's fighting to be the person that sits on th that throne usually people are fighting to be the sovereign right so what happens when everybody gets a throne what happens then right so i just want you to know that that's sort of the met and one I'm always letting you know so many meanings, but one way to read this is about sovereignty, everybody getting their own throne. And then Shariputra, of course, is like, I can't sit on that. I'm way too small. I'm way too little. And that's sort of the, it's sort of the, a compliment to this idea of sovereignty is also this poor little me type of an idea. And one of the things that I, I, I wanted to use right now, this moment to allude to Michael Taft's meditation, if you were there on Thursday, you know, Michael Taft, he's doing a really amazing job at bringing to life these, these contemplations and meditations. And if you were there for Thursday, one of the main things that he was doing was you know, kind of obliterating senses of inside me and outside me. That really interesting yet arbitrary distinction about what I determined to be like inside my head, inside my, inside me, 
and then what I determine to be outside me and ultimately what I determine to be not me, right? So like the laptop, all this stuff is not me. The, these hairs, this is outside of me. And then I got the stuff going on inside of me. And of course, what Michael did in that beautiful meditation was try to show in a number of different, you know, beautiful little deconstructions of how that sense of self as having two sides an inside and an exterior are kind of rather mind made and aspects of clinging. And if you kind of start letting go of them, it's like, whoa, where do I begin? Where do I end? Right? Well, the next step of that is this ability then to start expanding how big you are, <laughs> right? So now it's not just about your little sense of self being neither inside nor outside, but now you can be as big as you want. That is sort of the abhinya, this super power that Vimalakirti taught to the disciples and to the, the younger bodhisattvas. He told them how to transcend the limitations of their sense of the physical body. And now they're Yojana's tall, sitting on giant thrones, totally self-sovereign. I have a question, Michael, about that. Um, so it seems like because Sharputra is kind of not able to get big enough uh, for his throne, essentially, the word that is used, if I recall correctly, is devotion. Uh, oh, yeah, thank that's you. That's kind of the key. And I'm a little confused about that devotion to this uh, other Buddha. Yep. Uh, so, so what does that mean exactly? So that word is pranidana, P-R-A-N-I-D-H-A-N-A. Uh, it is one of the 10 paramitas I listed the first night. It's number eight. So number seven is upaya or skillful means. All, all of this is skillful means, by the way. And then the next, number eight, is pranidana. Surrender, devotion. There's a tradition that translates pranidana as vow, like making a vow. But yeah, a vow, like you vow to do something, but more actually like a wedding vow. So when when i'm glad i thank you also by the way for asking this question because i was really about to to gloss over it what is being asked of the bodhisattvas and the disciples when or shariputra here is to like surrender themselves to like give up the ego to to like islam the, the, the arabic is islam that's what's being asked and it's a really heavy thing and i want all you know everybody to know that yeah in Buddhism, this becomes devotional Buddhism, pure land Buddhism. You can devote yourself to Amitabha Buddha, Amiteyas Buddha, Akshobhya Buddha, and you can basically do bhakti kind of devotion. You get up every morning, light candles for your Buddha or Bodhisattva, go crazy, great. In the context of this sutra, though, what I really think is being uh, asked, what Vimalakirti is saying is like, surrender your little ego self that's it you know and again this is one of the paramitas it's pranidana and in many ways you kind of don't get to get the superpowers until you do this and this is true in the old traditions too where you have ishvara or maheshvara this kind of godhead and it's not till you surrender yourself to maheshvara the godhead that you get to get the superpowers so there's a lot of parallels here, but uh, thanks for that question. I just wanted to comment on that, that that's what's being talked about. Okay, we're going to move forward unless there's any other quick qu questions or comments about this. Right. Again, I could go uh, for days about the thrones and the, all of this stuff. So it's a little unfortunate. I had way more to say about the uh, Maru banner um, and all that, but we're good. Julio. So the third movement, this is it. Now we're at the inconceivable. Get ready, buckle up. <laughs> so then the Venerable Shariputra said to the Licha Vivi Malakirti, 
Noble sir, it is astonishing that these thousands of thrones, so big and so high, should fit into such a small house, and that the great city of Vaishali, the villages, cities, kingdoms, and the capitals of all of Jambudvipa and the other three continents, the abodes of the gods, the Nagas, the Yakshas, the Gandharavas, the Asuras, the Garudas, the Kinaras, and the Maharagas, that all of these should appear without any obstacle, just as they were before. The Lichavi Vimalakirti replied, Shariputra, for the Buddhas, the Tathagatas, and the Bodhisattvas, there is a vimoksha, a liberation called asintyata vimoksha, inconceivable. The bodhisattva who lives, who dwells in the inconceivable liberation can put the king of mountains, Sumaru, which is so high, so great, so noble and so vast into a mustard seed. He can perform this feat without enlarging the mustard seed and without shrinking the mountain Sumaru. And all the deities of the assembly of the four Maharajas around Mount Maru and of the 33 levels of heaven above Mount Maru, they don't even know where they are. Only those beings who are destined to be disciplined by miracles, see and understand the putting of the king of mountains, Sumaru, into the mustard seed. That, Shariputra, is an entrance to the domain of the inconceivable liberation of bodhisattvas. Furthermore, Shariputra, the bodhisattva who lives in the inconceivable liberation can pour into a single pore of his skin all the waters of the four great oceans without injuring the water animals such as fish, tortoises, crocodiles, frogs, and all the other creatures. And without the nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, and asuras even being aware of where they are. And the whole operation is visible without any injury or disturbance to any of those living beings. Such a bodhisattva can pick up with his right hand this 3,000-fold world system as if it were a potter's wheel and spinning it around, <laughs> throw it beyond universes as numerous as the sands of the Ganges rivers without the living beings therein knowing their motion or, or its origin. That bodhisattva can catch it and put it back in its place without the living being suspecting there of any coming or going. And yet the whole operation is perfectly visible. Furthermore, Shariputra, there are beings who become disciplined after an immense period of time. And there are also those who are disciplined after only a short period of time. The Bodhisattva who lives in the inconceivable liberation for the sake of training those living beings who are disciplined through immeasurable periods of time, that Bodhisattva can make the passing of a week seem like the passing of an entire kalpa. And they can make the passing of an entire kalpa seem like the passing of a week for those who are disciplined through a short period of time actually perceiving a week to be passing as if an eon, and those disciplined by a short period of time actually perceive a kalpa to be passing, to be the passing of a week. Thus a bodhisattva who lives in this inconceivable liberation can manifest all the splendors of the virtues of all the Buddha lands within a single Buddha land. Likewise, they can place all living beings in the palm of their right hand, and can show them with the supernatural speed of thought all the Buddha lands without ever leaving their own Buddha land. They can display a single pore, all they can display in a single pore of their body all the off, all the offerings ever offered to all Buddhas of the ten directions, 
and all the orbs of all the suns and moons and stars of the ten directions. A bodhisattva who lives in the inconceivable liber liberation can inhale all the hurricanes of the cosmic wind of the, all ten directions into their mouth without harming their own body and without letting the forests and the grasses of all the Buddha lands be flattened. They can take all the masses of fire of all the supernovas that ultimately consume all the universes of all the Buddha lands into their stomach without interfering with their own functions. Having crossed Buddha lands as numerous as sands in the Ganges rivers downward and having taken up a Buddha land, they can rise up through Buddha lands as numerous as the sands of the Ganges river and place it on high just as a strong man may pick up a jujube leaf on the point of a needle. Thus, a bodhisattva who lives and dwells in the inconceivable liberation can magically transform any kind of living being into a universal monarch, a lokapala, a chakra, a brahma, a disciple, a solitary sage, a bodhisattva, even a Buddha. The bodhisattva can transform miraculously all the cries and noises, superior, mediocre, and inferior, of all living beings in the ten directions into the voice of the Buddha, with the words of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, having them all proclaim impermanent, miserable, empty, selfless. And they can cause them to recite the words and sounds of all the teachings ever taught by all the Buddhas in all ten directions. Shariputra, I have only shown you but a small part of the entrance to the domain of the Bodhisattva who lives in the inconceivable liberation. Teaching of the full entrance in the in to the domain of the bodhisattva who lives in the inconceivable liberation would require more than a kalpa, and even more than that. Okay, thus ends the section on the inconceivable liberation. Questions, answers, ideas, or comments? A lot going on there. So yeah, yeah. So is this like just like ultimate like non-duality? You know, you know. It's interesting about this word non-duality. You know, and the word, the idea. Yes. Yep. <laughs> it, it is extreme non-duality, but I think so one of, one of the things that comes to my mind as far as like <clears throat> what's going on here and how to think of it, this is a, one of those sutras that like I said, it fits into a larger category of sutras that's talking about the inconceivable and all of these ideas. But one way to think about it, I mean, the reason why I'm hesitating on this idea of non-duality, right, is that, that in many ways, this is an even subtler teaching than non-duality. And what I mean by that is, is that there's, there's non-duality. There's this idea of like dualism, subject, object, relationship, self and other. That's duality. And then there's sort of a collapsing of, or I won't say collapsing, but a kind of an abandoning of duality. A la the ideas of in and out. And so in that regard, yes, this is extreme non-duality where there's no more in and out, right? But I would suggest that from a Dharmic Buddhist point of view, it's helpful to see a progression going on. And what that progression is, is yes, 
we start in the dualistic Michael, Tanya, self and other situation, right? And then through various processes, whether they be intellectual, emotional, or otherwise, there's a breaking down of that duality. But from a Buddhist point of view, what the breaking down of that duality does is reveal the empty nature of all things in their individuality. Right? So I hope that makes sense that it's sort of, I mean, if you're like, you know, a Dharma head, that's like, duh. But I just want to make that subtle shift clear that if we're dealing with perception of self and perception of object and whether it's self and other self and the and a whatever a pencil or whatever right self and other in buddhism when the duality between those breaks down again the sort of existent nature of that thing that i was perceiving to be other the nature of that thing gets be revealed to be empty, emptiness, no svabhava, as they say, no self-nature. So you go like, in Buddhism, you go from non-duality sort of to emptiness. Oh, so everything individually underneath is like a foam or a bubble or a plantain tree or whatever, right? It's like totally nothing going on under there. So this is sort of the, like the great evacuation of everything, right? Well, if you follow me, this is sort of like repopulating the world in a, what I to describe it is if we were just talking, talking about emptiness, this is fullness. And it's a fullness where, well, fullness because you can take all the into a, a hair pore of your body but it, it's more to do with this idea of like um well yeah I, I guess it's more to do with this idea of like that emptiness can get a little bleak in that way because it's like oh well then there's nobody there then and there's no it just kind of, there's a way that it can lead to like an, an emptiness, even inside. And what this is describing is like when everything is kind of brought back from emptiness and any, any perceived individual thing actually is a monolithic whole of the totality. <laughs> yes, that's kind of what I, because I was trying to figure out like if he's doing all this stuff, how could that happen? And it's sort of if like everything is everything. Yeah, and so that's and where these like really <laughs> subtle differences between non-duality and emptiness. And I guess tathata is usually what I'm describing as fullness. Tathata is usually uh, translated as suchness or as it isness. But I wanted to, on that point, though, uh, now that we've gotten into the inconceivable liberation, this asintyata vimoksha, this word moksha may not be, it may not be familiar to us Dharma heads because the Buddhists don't use it that much. If you're a yogi or a yogini, or if you're deep in the kind of Vedic system, moksha is the name of the game. This word moksha means release. And the, the, ana the analogy or the metaphor is, imagine you were in a straight jacket. <laughs> imagine you had shackles on, right? And then imagine somebody took that straight jacket off. Imagine somebody took those shackles off. You'd be released. You'd be free. Well, that's moksha, liberation. Again, the Buddhists don't use moksha much. They talk, obviously, a lot about nirvana things like that, the unconditioned, things like that. This is a case, we're going to talk a little bit about moksha. Um, the Buddhists, they're using a term vimoksha, Sanskrit folks out there, the v, vi is this to see, right? And so it's sort of like moksha via insight, moksha via seeing. That's the vimoksha, just to... 
as far as I understand it, give you a heads up on that. What happens is, is that in the uh, Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha, the old suttas, the old ones, the very last of the old ones, the Maha Pari Nirvana Sutra, the sutra where the Buddha dies. Interesting. It's in that sutra that the Buddha starts talking a lot about moksha. Surprise, surprise, right? Talking a lot about release and liberation. And in the Maha Pari Nirvana Sutra, in the Digan Nikaya, the Buddha lays out the process for obtaining the knowledge of peace or nirvana or cessation, the sixth of the super knowledges. And what he lists in the Pari Nirvana Sutra are these eight, the Ashta Vimoksha, the eight liberations. Hmm. What are the eight liberations for the Buddha? According to the Buddha, according to the Buddha on his deathbed, what are the eight liberations? Well, before I go through them real quick, the, for the Dharma heads out there, it more or less maps on to the four dhyanas and four formless dhyanas or the four samadhis. So if you're familiar with that process of moving through four dhyanic states and then moving through four <clears throat> formless states, that's basically the liberation technique. In the Parinirvana Sutra, the Buddha actually lists the first liberation, the first vimoksha, is realizing that it's form seeing form. It's the first liberation, an understanding that it is matter seeing matter, form coming into contact with form. The second is seeing only external form. And that is basically the meditation that Michael was doing with you on Thursday, if you were there, which was for it to only be external <laughs> or, you know, only internal. Like it kind of doesn't matter at that point because the idea is, is that there is only one form, rupa. And in this tradition, it is this, so rather than there being form inside and form outside, there's just form, arguably external, but external to what, right? The third, the third is my favorite. This is a moksha, a vimoksha. It is a moment that transcends the all external form. And it is this realization that everything's beautiful. And you actually kind of have this thought. It's so beautiful. <laughs> this feeling and actually almost like a sound in your head where you hear, this is beautiful. From the beautiful, then we end, this is number four, we enter into that realm of infinite space I spoke about earlier. Just meditation on the quality of space. That gives way to meditating on infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness. Then moving on, number seven now, to the state of neither perception nor non perception, neither samya nor no samya. And then the eighth all desires nirvana nirodha cessation here's the point folks i'm going to start trying to tie this together real quick because i do want to read the last part there's um there's a lot that i wanted to say and didn't really have time to say about upaya skillful means right so if you've been here, you know, this idea of skillful means is sort of like understanding your audience, understanding the student, understanding the mind of the student, and then knowing a certain way of putting something or a certain something to get that will work to get that person to go further along. 
or to understand, right? And there's a way in which even in the early, early um, uh, kind of Asamkhya, Vedic, Patanjali, like the early stuff, when I was talking about the other schools that have their eight superpowers, it's kind of a question of like, are they serious? Like walking on water or diving into the ground, right? I'm the, everybody knows if you've studied with me, I'm wide open. I'm all for the possibility of walking on water. Fine, yeah. But upayically speaking, there's also something kind of going on here where it's like, oh, you want to walk on water? Well, all you got to do is sit still for five hours straight, right? <laughs> That's all you got to do, right? With the idea being that after five hours, your mind will be so clear, you won't, you don't want, you'll be like, why did I want to walk on water? Why did I, right? So there's a way in which these, these super knowledges may have always been functioning as a kind of upaya, right? Um, touch the sun and the moon. You can fly up and touch the sun and the moon, right? So, the reason why I say that is, is that Vimalakirti just did a bunch of upaya, right? He brought thrones in from other worlds and he's doing all this stuff and displaying these supernormal powers, right? And what, okay, so the reason why I, I started this class by going through these variations on the eight ridhis is because if you look at those eight ridhis and whether it's this person's list or that person's list or that person's list, ideas like being able to fulfill all your desires, right? It's from a Buddhist point of view, it's like, really, really fulfill all your desires, right? So when I read this list, for me, this is classic Buddhism where it's like, come on, these are the eight liberations. And what I mean by that is in the Diga Nikaya, the old, 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 old sutra, I think in that old sutra, the Buddha was saying, you don't, don't worry about those eight, worry about these. These are the vimoksha, these are the liberations, right? So then what happens when you do that again? right? You, you make fun of it again. And what I mean is, is that if this was the original Buddha making fun of the eight superpowers, the inconceivable liberation is the most mind-blowing upayic liberation that you can encounter. <laughs> if you're following my Mahayana gist here, right? <laughs> Okay, questions. I'm gonna. I do want to read the last part. It's kind of. It's great. Um, hey, Michael. Yeah, uh, Eric. What's so, up? Man? Yeah, I want to make this question. I wanted to piggyback on what you were saying regarding uh, non-dualism and how you took us through this thing that you started calling fullness. And I, my question has to take that and go back to the beginning of. Manjushri disappearing all the furniture and stuff in this room. And this metaphor that is making between mind and awareness. And to put it in more like Tibetan language, uh, yeshe, uh, natural wakefulness, and ordinary mind or sen. Uh, so it is clear that yeshe, natural wakefulness, is by the karmic forces always trying to find a base to sit, to sit on. Even in the jhanas, it's always about finding a base. Now, uh, and this observe, this just, let's call it contemplation of Jeshi alone without Sam is what my Dzogchen practice is about. And I'm bringing Dzogchen in here because for Dzogchen, I don't know how Michael Taft teaches, because I haven't been attending his meditations, but in Sokchen, 
is very, very clear that this natural wakefulness, it is present all the time, even in the lapses between two thoughts, it's everywhere. But obviously we are ordinary beings and we don't see it. So for Dzogchen, this contemplation of Yeshe is nested upon the practices of Anu Yoga, of a state of, stage of completion of Tantra, which employs practices such as Salun Fulkor or Tumo, very advanced practices of non-dual bliss in order to just contemplate that yeshe. It's not so much about the bliss, really. It's about the yeshe that is there so present. And Anu Yoga is based on Maha Yoga, which is the tantric system of generation and perfectioning. So there's a system, a whole set of tantric practices to rest on this, this awareness, this yeshe, this natural wakefulness. And my question then is, <laughs> what was the system in Mahayana in this, during these times? Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. What was the system of practice? Because yes, I understand yep. all your rebellion, how we can contemplate it through uh, devotion in many other ways, but how was this systematic practice in these times for people doing this? I can tell you again. I do want to try to read a little bit, so I'm going to make it a quick one. Mm -hmm. It's going to be dense, though. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you brought up this distinction between what I'm just going to call a conditioned mind mm -hmm. and unconditioned in that sense of free, natural. And Michael Taft, in his uh, meditation on Thursday night, uh, I believe he might have been even answering a question or something i forget but he made this beautifully clear comment that's often you know for myself very hard to articulate but it's this idea that a that natural state of mind that's that is liberated that is free and all of that it requires no effort in fact it's effort that's getting us suffering mm -hmm. So this, this idea of like pursuing enlightenment, yeah, you'll never get it. It's not a pursuit. The problem is we're pursuing, we're pursuing desire, we're pursuing delights. And so we're, we're being kept from that natural state by our own doing. And therefore meditation is a grand not doing. <laughs> and the better you are at not doing, you sink, so to speak, back into that natural state. And, and in fact, it requires zero effort. The reason why I mention this is that that idea of the ordinary mind that's conditioned, and in particular, the ordinary mind that's based on sights, sounds, sense, flavors, tactiles, and thoughts, that conditioned mind, the reason why this is inconceivable, it's inconceivable to that mind. Mm -hmm. Only the natural mind, only that natural state can comprehend this. So the degree to which you were comprehending this, and I know that you were, it was that natural state that was comprehending it. It was the, un, it was the conditioned mind that let go for a minute that was getting it in that way. To answer your question more explicitly and directly though, I wanna refer you uh, to the Avatamsaka Sutra, Oop. the Flower Garland Sutra as it's called. This is a giant three volume, the Maha of sutras, right? What I have actually, in the course of preparing for the last few classes, I've come to realize, I knew this all along, but I didn't realize the degree to which this was true. This sutra, sometimes it's called the Avatamsaka Sutra, but it's actually more often called the Asintyata Vimoksha Sutra. It is the Inconceivable Liberation Sutra. And if you get deep enough, if you go far enough into volume, this is just volume one, but if you go deep enough in, and you can hold on because it's a ride, but if you can go deep enough in, 
there's a chapter in which he goes through the inconceivable liberation. And it's pretty wild because it, it involves beginning with sensations in the eye and exiting out through the object. And it gets really wild as you move through it because it gets psychedelic. He really starts turning you inside out with the idea that by the time you've walked through this process, and the process, by the way, is it's not very different than the type of meditations Michael's doing on Thursdays. That type of graduated um, uh, contemplations, right? So if you're really interested in this inconceivable liberation, check out the Avatamsaka Sutra. I'll tell you that. Because there were practices for sure. Mm. Any other questions or comments before I read the last little bit? Just, yeah, I mean, sorry. Oh. Yeah. I just want to say in 10 oh, seconds. Oh, no, no, Jean-Francois, I'm sorry. Unless you, uh, yeah. yeah, I was just wanting to make a joke. Will you do a 250-week uh, series with Michael <laughs> and the, v, <laughs> the Avatam Saga? <laughs> I, I do want to do, I'm not going to do the whole thing. Uh, I do the whole thing with private students, uh, but I do, I will do a part of it soon. Prop, maybe even following this up in, in uh, June or whatever. Awesome. Thanks. For sure. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Okay. So there's this beautiful little end part here that uh, it's, it's really wild. And yeah, there, I don't really, there's not much to say about it. I just, I wanted to read it. It's a very, it's a very interesting message. Again, I don't think it's, it's really that hard to understand, but I don't know, it's interesting. So, um, little Kashapya, <laughs> the patriarch as he's called. So then the patriarch, Maha Kashapya, having heard this teaching of the inconceivable liberation of the Bodhisattva, was amazed. And he said to the Venerable Shariputra, Venerable Shariputra, if one were to show a variety of things to a person blind from birth, he would not be able to see a single thing. Likewise, Venerable Shariputra, when this Dharma door of the inconceivable liberation is taught, all the disciples and solitary sages are sightless, like the man blind from birth and cannot comprehend even a single cause of the inconceivable liberation. Who, <clears throat> who is there among the wise who, hearing about this inconceivable liberation, does not conceive the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment? As for us, whose faculties are deteriorated <clears throat> like a burned and rotten seed, what else can we do if we do not become receptive of this Mahayana, this great vehicle? We, all the disciples and all the solitary sages, upon hearing this teaching of the Dharma, should utter a cry of regret that would shake this 3,000-fold world system. And as for all these bodhisattvas, when they hear this inconceivable liberation, they should be as joyful as a young crown prince when he takes the diadem and is anointed. And they should increase to the utmost their devotion to this inconceivable liberation. Indeed, what could the entire host of Maras, the devils, the demons ever do to one who is devoted to this inconceivable liberation? When the patriarch Mahakashapya had uttered this discourse, 32,000 gods conceived the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. But then the Lichavi Vimalakirti said to the patriarch Mahakashapya, Venerable Kashapya, the Maras, the devils, the demons, who play the devil in innumerable universes of the ten directions are all bodhisattvas dwelling in the inconceivable liberation who are playing the devil in order to develop living beings through their liberative techniques 
through their skillful means. Reverend Kashyapya, all the miserable beggars who come to the bodhisattvas of all the innumerable universes in the 10 directions to ask for a hand or a foot or an ear or a nose or for some blood or muscles or bones or marrow or an eye or a torso or a head or some limbs or a member or a throne or a kingdom or a country or a wife or a son or a daughter or a slave or a horse or an elephant or a chariot, a cart, gold, silver, jewels, pearl, conches, crystal, coral, barrel, treasures, food, drink, elixirs, and clothes. These demanding beggars are actually bodhisattvas living in the inconceivable liberation who, through their upaya, their skillful means, wish to test and thus demonstrate the firmness of the high resolve of all bodhisattvas. How is this? Kashapya, the bodhisattvas demonstrate that firmness by means of terrible austerities. The bodhisattvas demonstrate that firmness by means of terrible austerities. Ordinary persons have no power to be thus demanding of bodhisattvas unless they are granted the opportunity. They are not capable of killing and depriving in that manner without being freely given the chance. Kashapya, just as a glowworm cannot eclipse the light of the sun, so too, Venerable Kashapya, it is not possible without special allowance that an ordinary person can thus attack and deprive a bodhisattva. Venerable Kashapya, just as a donkey could not muster an attack on a wild elephant, even so, Kashapya, one who is not himself a bodhisattva cannot harass a bodhisattva. Only one who is themselves a bodhisattva can harass another bodhisattva. And only a bodhisattva can tolerate the harassment of another bodhisattva. Kashapya, such is the introduction to the power of the knowledge of the liberative technique, the skillful means of the bodhisattva who lives and dwells in the inconceivable liberation. The end. So a little twist at the end there. All right. All right, folks, unless you got any last comments, questions, or ideas, I uh, would probably turn it over to Katie. I had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious if your interpretation of, or your opinion on the interpretation that the superpowers are actually lucid dreams, the results of lucid dreams. The results of lucid dreams. Yeah, like experience during lucid dreams. Oh, got you, got you. Um. Well, I'll tell you. I didn't. I was going to mention this at the outset. Um, I first got really into the Vimalakirti Sutra, and I certainly started studying all of these because when I was a graduate student and I was doing my some doctoral work at, at Princeton. All I was interested in was this stuff. I, I was basically studying magic in Buddhism, the role of the Buddhist monk as like magician. And, and there's no better Buddhist magician than Vimalakirti. So I was very interested in studying all that stuff. So I spent a good deal of time deep in this world. And it, do, it does not seem like they're talking about lucid dreams at all. There's very detailed meditations in particular uh, talk real quick about the idea of sinking into the ground like it's water or standing on the water like it's the ground i because of the obvious uh jesus parallel with the walking on water it's hard not to get enticed by that i found a book i tra i used to translate these books of spells of like buddhist magic spells and in one of them, it was the spell. It was the, the magic for how to walk on water. And what I found, yeah, there was some rites, again, R-I-T-E-S, some rites you had to do. And there were some 
uh, uh, incantations, daranis, or spells. But what I found the most interesting aspect of that meditation magic was the primary activity was meditating on the surface of the water as if it were solid, like for hours until you were so confirmly vi- convinced that it was solid that then you could walk on it. And that sounded to me like a, a kind of a deep reprogramming, rewiring of the conditioned mind that perhaps, as I have suggested in past Dharma talks, perhaps physics is just a condition of the mind, you know? Uh, yeah. And what, what, I, what I mean by that is, is that, you know, in this world, we drop something and it falls, right? But if we have it in a dream, that happens too. And so what's interesting about the dreamscape is that for some reason, somehow we preserve the properties of physics and physics behave more or less like they do in this world. Things rarely fall up in a dream. They fall very naturally quite to the ground, right? So if you're into that idea of like, wow, that's interesting that my mind preserves the law of physics in a dream. Well, maybe your mind's just preserving the law of physics via a conditioned samskaric state. Or not. <laughs> All right. I'll make that my last answer. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining for part three, chapter six of the Malakirti experience. Um, again, I, I, as always, I hope that was elucidating and not obfuscating. Um, a ton of stuff I wanted to talk about that I didn't get a chance, so I'll try to get that information out somehow. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks again, and I hope you join Michael on Thursday for his uh, inconceivable meditation. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for being here. And I have a couple exciting things uh, to tell you all. And before I do that, the first thing I want to say is that when we started the Dharma Collective, we started it on the foundational principle that the Dharma should be accessible to everybody and should never be behind a financial barrier so that anyone who wants to be uh, in the metaphorical room, to be in the Buddha field with us to receive these teachings is able to. Um, But that only works if people who are able to donate, donate. So please donate if you can. um, And your donations enable people who normally wouldn't be able to go to a place that charges uh, to be here in this room with us and to hear these teachings. So donate if you can. Um, Noam, I think, has put the links in the chat. Uh, Copy and paste those links. And then breaking news, uh, this Thursday, uh, Michael Taft's complimentary meditation will happen in this Zoom room. So we'll be able to ask questions during the Q&A and kind of interact in a more direct way than we have been. So uh, back here Thursday night to do the meditation. And the one other thing that I think some people here will be very interested in is on Saturday, well, obviously, first of all, Friday night, if you don't know, I always assume everyone knows this, but Friday night, uh, Michael will be back here, same room, uh, doing a uh, a visual talk entitled From the Ten Directions, uh, Buddhist Geography. So that's going to be awesome. Come back here on Friday. And then if you, uh, like some of us, are just taking uh, some downtime to be on mini retreat, also come back Saturday. Uh, We will have um, Eve Ekman and Chandra Easton here on Saturday, and they are doing a lojong day long. Um, And so that's a compassion practice. And Eve brings a deep, deep knowledge of psychology and also deep practice. And Chandra brings deep practice. And um, together, they're doing this kind of scientifically, psychologically grounded compassion practice, which is a very good thing to be doing right now. Uh, So come back on Saturday for that. So we'll see you here basically every day this week, (laughs) right here in the Zoom room. Uh, So thank you, Michael. And thank you all for being here and for your practice.